Well, it is good to be with you this morning. Had, Tammy and I had a great time away and very refreshing and relaxing. And uh, Lord, this morning as we continue in your word, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and that you would continue to accomplish in us everything that's according to your heart's desire. But we're quite amazed at this partnership that we have with you, that we get to join you on your mission in the earth, and we get to do that together as a family of God with brothers and sisters in Christ. What a joy, what a privilege, what an honor. Lord, again, we acknowledge your presence and we are so excited that you have put us in this congregation at this time in history to be a part of what you're doing. Thank you. And now, God, that we spend time with you in your word and ask that you would anoint our ears, anoint our eyes, and anoint our hearts to hear, see, and receive what you have for us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I've been enjoying talking about our vision at Calvary and talking about what the Lord is saying and doing through our history as a congregation. And what we're in, we're talking about community right now. And this is the fourth part of a message on our history, expressing true Christian community. And today we're going to talk about the why of community, the why of community. As a matter of fact, you can turn your Bibles if you would like to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 14 to 21. We're going to talk about the why of community. In part one, we celebrated the fact that God has called us to join him together with others on his mission in the earth and that what God has done in Calvary starting this church, he's been expressing his nature and his will expressing who he is, and he created us to be a church that embraces and that expresses intimacy, community, and kingdom. In part two, we heard from Angela Petrie about the impact of Calvary on her life, and then we had a significant sharing that she did of a word from Paul Cain for this historic hour, and then I shared some prophetic words that I had received. And then in part three, we reminded ourselves that we were meant to do life together with one another and with the triune God. We considered the outcomes of community and we talked a little bit about God's vision for Greater Houston. Again, I, I'm just, I'm in awe that God has allowed me and you to be alive for such a time as this. That God has allowed me and you to be here at this historic place, at this historic hour, so that we could serve God's purposes. It is an honor, it's a privilege, and it is challenging, right? To live for God in this, in this hour. But I'm not looking at the past to the good old days. I'm grateful that you're here together with us and that we get to serve the Lord and get to go forward in the spirit of the Lord into his purposes. So today, we're gonna talk about the why of community. I just wanna remind you the beginning, Calvary started in 1982. God birthed Calvary, and then uh, before the church started, then after the church started, we were about reaching the unreached. Uh, we did a religious census in the area and discovered that about back then, about 85% of the people in our community did not belong to a church, did not go to a church regularly or even occasionally. And so those statistics are actually higher than that now. And uh, so we did a lot of ministry and a lot of reaching uh, people. The whole church was involved in reaching out. Then in 1985, God got our attention and he began to make course corrections in our lives as individuals and as a congregation. As we began to live out what God was doing, God led us into three stories. Uh, my story was from 1985 to about 1988, establishing people in intimacy with God. One of the parts of our vision is to establish people in an intimate relationship with the living God. By the way, I'm praying that when you come to church, when you go to small group, when you participate in youth ministry or children's ministry, whatever it is, I'm praying that you have a holy expectation of encounter with the God who is alive and who is present. So much of the time we can go through life unaware and we can miss the God who is near. Jesus actually said, I am always with you. I, I'm right here with you. 
And so I pray that we'll become aware of that. Jesus actually said the kingdom of God is, is near you. It's in you. And so God is this transcendent God who is present with us and then mysteriously lives in us. So my story, 1985 to 1988, establishing people in intimacy with God and the core outcome that we're looking for is awareness. We want to be aware of his presence. Then this, the kingdom, uh, that's, that's my story, the story, the overarching story that we're participating in was from 1988 to about 19. Uh, 96, God emphasized that for us in our church life, extending the kingdom of God in all the earth. Extending the kingdom of God in all the earth. And the outcome there, there's actually two outcomes, alignment and action. Alignment and action. So intimacy with God, the outcome, how do you know if you're growing in intimacy with God? Are you becoming more aware of God in your daily life, in the dailiness of life? In the kingdom story, the story, how do you know if you're, if you're advancing in, in transformation in that area? Are you aligning with the ways of Jesus? And are you in action, obedience around what God is showing you and doing in your life? Then our story, community story, about 1997, and we've been living into that story, learning a lot, expressing true Christian community, expressing true Christian community. How do you know if you're growing in true Christian community? Well, the outcome there is authenticity, is authenticity. Are we able to be open and honest with people in our spheres of influence? Uh, Y'all know networking is an assignment from the Lord that I have uh, locally and globally. Uh, I was at a meeting, uh, we were at a prayer meeting downtown at the Houston Police Officers Union building a couple of weeks ago, midday, uh, Ricky Bradshaw and other leaders had gathered people to come and pray for officers. They were praying for them online, they were praying for them in person, and then while we were waiting, we were praying for revival and for spiritual awakening for Houston, Texas, greater Houston area. And uh, sitting in our small group, one of the young men there uh, looked at me and, and, and began to, to get stirred in, in the prophetic and began to share some things. And he said, um, he said, hey, I just, I want to encourage you, uh, just get prayer from people. Uh, I don't know if you ever have the chance to get prayer from people, but I want you to know, I think God wants me to emphasize that for you. Do you ever get prayer from people? And I got to thinking about it, and I said, well, you know, I participate in three missional communities, three or four per week, and at all those, walking in the light and getting prayer is a part of my experience and my expression. And he just looked at me, and he said, whenever I visit with pastors, none of them are able to share with others and get prayer. They never get to do that. And I got to thinking, we are an unusual bunch, aren't we? And that we get to do that with the deacons, the elders, the staff, the different missional community teams that I'm a part of. Calvary, I want you to know I could not do what I do without your prayers and without getting prayer from you guys and without walking the light with y'all. Amen? And I hope that that is a part of your vision and your DNA. Man, take advantage of every opportunity. We were not meant to live isolated lives. Now, I can understand growing up in the church why especially pastors would not share with people. Because when they shared with people, people had these weapons that were put in their hands and then they used them against leadership. I saw that all the time. But you're of a different breed. You're a different kind of people, amen? And I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for letting this be a house where men and women can walk in the light. We also have our pastor's prayer group where, where we have the opportunity to walk in the light with other area pastors. We meet twice a month, and we've been meeting uh, either every week or twice a month or every other week since the mid-'90s. And then one of the privileges about being a part of a team is other staff members come to us. They've been coming to this church to... Uh, Pastor Steve's leadership and other staff members, they come to get ministry and get prayer because ministry can be a lonely place. But I want you to know, ministry is not a lonely place for us on staff here at Calvary, and we are blessed. Calvary, I love you guys and love the fact that you pray for us and that you willingly lay hands on us and you pray on us, I mean pray for us regularly. I wanna thank you for that. That was a joke. That was my one funny for the day and you missed it. Doing life together. 
Thank you for that false laugh, Daniel. We were meant to do life together and with one another and with the triune God. The idea of community is a challenge for us in Western culture. Rather than showing up in segmented silos or independent contractors, isolated individuals, we want to increase our community awareness, our community vision, and our community impact for the Lord. So now you're in Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 14 to 21. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, Paul said, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than we could ask, think, or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and forever. Amen. This passage teaches us that there are dimensions of the love of Christ that you and I cannot experience without doing it together in community, in community. And we are actually called, this passage talks about we are called to do life together in community. So the why of community, why is community a part of our vision at Calvary? Well, First of all, community is a part of the nature of God. In this passage, Paul talks about, I'm, I'm kneeling before the Father. I'm praying that you will have a power encounter with the Holy Spirit so that Christ Jesus can dwell in your life in fullness. The Bible tells us and teaches us and reveals to us another passage is John chapter 14. You can go there and read about the activity of the Father and the Son coming and making their home with us. And then if that's not enough, Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned. I am going to send my spirit and he will be with you and he will be with you always, the counselor, the comforter who will come to be with you. So the scripture stresses that our God, he has revealed himself as the triune God, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are a community, they are one, and they're a community, and the Trinity is just a mystery. You know, I I wanted to teach and explain it and try to grasp it and grapple with it, and I want you to know, I just acknowledge God has revealed himself and how he's revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is three in one, God, 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 and and yet they're distinct individuals and personalities, so we just bow before our God, amen? And we acknowledge who our God is. And so community is actually a part of, of who God is in his very nature. And then we were made to connect very deeply with the Lord and with other people. Belonging, belonging is just a deep human need. As a matter of fact, many people are writing about and talking about today the tribes, our our culture. People are connecting in tribes and small units and clans. It's just a deep human need. In Genesis 2, 18, the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. This is a deep innate need is that we were created for community. We were created for partnership with others, belonging, and then interdependence. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 27. The the reality is we have a description here of how much we need each other and that we can't do this thing alone without one another. Now, for Americans who have cut our teeth on independence, And for Texans especially, who are proud of our capacity to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps, this passage stresses not independence, but interdependence. And so listen to the description of the body of Christ as Paul writes it here. The body is a unit, 
Though it's made up of many small parts, and though all of its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we're all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now did you hear in this passage the Trinity involved here? God, Jesus Christ, and the Spirit. And God has put us into the body, and whose body is it? The body of Christ. He is the head of the body we read in our opening prayer this morning. Amen? And so it's his body. This body does not belong to me. This body does not belong to you. Calvary is an expression of the life of Jesus Christ. The body and God has ordained. Verse 18 is a powerful passage. It says, in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. The reality is, you might think that you found this place, that you came here for a specific need or something like that, but God has led you to this place. When we were interviewing people and they were joining, uh, especially in the, the beginning years and, and through the 90s, we would ask people in our new members fellowship, Why, what led you to Calvary? Why are you here? And the, off, the, the answer that we got most often was, God led me here. God led me here. Now there's some people here that God has so planted them in this body that, that it doesn't even cross their mind to ever leave Calvary. They are planted here, and others are here for just a little while, and then God sows them into another body, sometimes in greater Houston and sometimes beyond. The reality is God adds to each body just as he wills. Amen? So it's not our decision. We follow the Lord. And we plug in and we become a part of the body. And I just want to thank you. If you've been here since the early 80s or if you've been here only a few weeks, thank you for being a part of what God is doing in this unique expression of the Lord Jesus Christ in this community and in the nations of the earth. And so belonging is an innate need that we have and we were created for interdependence. By the way, you know, we really don't understand the importance of our different body parts until one of them, to which we don't pay much attention, is inflamed or injured or hurt. Like, for instance, if your little toe meets the dresser in your bedroom and they have a conversation in the middle of the night, you will recognize how important that little toe is, won't you? Because that thing is now communicating to you in a very serious and strategic way. Every part is important. And isn't it funny when Paul says, what if every part were an eye? I mean, can you picture that? I mean, that would be unnatural. That would be ugly. And so 
Every part is important. And then love. Love, it's the defining virtue for how we were meant to live as human beings. And so God puts us in community because we have this need for belonging. We have this, this reality of our interdependence. And love is the controlling virtue. It's the most significant virtue. Love for God, Matthew 22, 37 to 39. Love for God, love for others. Love is our motive. Love is our means. And love is our vision to do life together. Listen, this is why God has put us into a body. We were made to connect deeply to the Lord and to others. Belonging, interdependence, and love. Then Jesus, as he walked the earth, and after he was raised and is ascended to the right hand of the Father, Jesus puts us into committed communities. Committed communities. Jesus called his disciples to follow him in Matthew 4, 19, and then he put them into a company of followers that were committed to follow him and do what he said and to say what he did. Jesus, in Luke chapter 9 and 10, sent out his disciples in groups. You remember that? He sent them out two by two in Luke chapter 9 and in Luke chapter 10. Then Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So a part of our identity as this community that's on mission with Jesus, a part of our identity involves advancing together as the corporate church, as the corporate body of Christ against the kingdom of darkness and plundering and plundering the enemy's camp. We are supposed to be on mission, partnering with Jesus, who calls us to live in community, in mission, on mission with him and with each other. And so we get involved with what God is doing in these committed communities. And then throughout the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 13, we have the mission team of Paul and Barnabas. God shows us that the, missions, the mission work, the work of God is done together. It's done in teams. It's done in these committed communities. And then Jesus puts us into local congregations called churches. Now, in the Bible, when it's speaking to the church at Ephesus, it's actually speaking to a bunch of different house churches, Right? in the book of Ephesus, that they're under uh, the leadership of the elders there. Timothy uh, is, is one of the leaders of the church in Ephesus. And so there, there's all these things going on. And so a church, there, there's not just a cookie cutter model of what the church is supposed to be. People say today, we wanna go back to the first century church and be the church that God wants us to be. And Pastor Steve through the years would, would ask us, so which church would that be? Would that be the church in Corinth? Would that be the church in Ephesus, Thessalonica? You see, God has unique expressions of his congregations and the congregations can be these huge celebrations, like in Acts chapter 5, in Acts chapter 4, they're gathering together as the, as the congregation of God, actually in the temple of the Lord, where the Jews gathered, and they were meeting in, in the church area there. They were meeting in that temple, and so there are large gatherings, there are, there are intimate corporate gatherings. The church meets as God gives its assignment, and there today, Houston, Texas has the greatest number of megachurches of any city in, in our nation. It's amazing what God is doing here, and that's not big enough. Did you know there's a church in Nigeria that holds a million people? That's a big place. That's really big. And so there are churches of all sizes. One of the pastors in our pastor's a prayer group. They're, they're planting hip hop churches among the younger generation and, and planting these churches among the street kids. Isn't that awesome? That vision? God, again, sees our need for belonging, interdependence, and to be the people or channels of God's love as our, as our motivation, as our vision, as our ministry. And then God puts us in these congregations, and every congregation has a unique calling unique assignments, unique giftings that God wants to do to express himself in the earth. And so local churches are committed communities of faith that are on display for the glory of God and 
they are there so that the world can see and experience God in his uniqueness and in his multifaceted beauty. And so the church, community is a really important part of the vision. So the Lord uses community. We talked about our vision as a vision of transformation. God uses community as one of his primary ways to transform us. We believe that the Lord uses a holistic model to transform our lives. Our, our vision at Calvary is not just a vision for the wall, but it's the three primary ways that God engages us to change us, to transform us. Establishing people in intimacy with God, this is the reflective life where we learn to hear the voice of God and co-create with him. And the core outcome of intimacy with God is what? Remember pop test? Oh, thank you, very excellent. Awareness. The core outcome of intimacy with God is awareness. Expressing true Christian community. We're learning to grow in our authenticity. We're learning to grow to share a, a shared life on a shared mission with the Lord. And the core outcome of community is what? Authenticity. And then extending the kingdom of God in the earth. This is where we grow in radical obedience, in partnering with the Lord on his mission. We live missionally in community and we live not as isolated individuals, but in partnership with the Lord and with one another. And the core outcomes of this part of our vision, the core outcomes of kingdom, are what? Alignment and? This is just exciting. Don't you just feel that? Experiencing true Christian community is a place where we have a shared vision a shared life together, and it's one of the primary tools that God uses to change us. God uses, he uses community to transform your life. 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus changes us. You can't be changed in isolation. As a matter of fact, we're learning today that people overcome addictions most effectively by being in intimate communities. And so we have different recovery groups. You have different assignments. And if you try to overcome anything like addiction on your own, you're going to fail because we were meant to be together to overcome these things. We need counsel. We need guidance. We need prayer. We need support. We need friendship. We need nurture. And so God uses community to change us. He uses community to heal us. In James chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, there are actually two models of prayer there, two models of healing prayer. One is, it says, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. In other words, walk in the light. Be authentic. Walk there and, and share with people what you need prayer for. And then it also says, so you can be physically healed or emotionally healed or spiritually healed, whatever you need. It also says you can call on the elders to anoint you with oil and their prayer can result in healing. So there's two models of healing prayer, transformational prayer there. By the way, when we do our healing service tonight or any time when you come up here, you can ask the teams, would you anoint me with oil? And we'll be glad to do that. We were actually asked that question not too long ago. Do we ever anoint people with oil and pray for them? The answer is yes when they ask for it. By the way, that's not the only model of healing prayer in the New Testament, right? We don't have a record of Jesus doing that. But that is a, a, a testimony, and it is a model of healing prayer. So God can use community to change us, to heal us, to develop virtue and character in us. I want to challenge you for your homework assignment today. Read Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 17. Colossians 3, 1 to 17. God wants to develop virtue and character in us. And there's an illustration of how God does that in community where we're living in this place of learning to forgive one another. We're learning to, to be the body of Christ together. Then we realize our full potential of growing in Christ and we do that in community. Now again, we read Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 to 21. You cannot, you cannot explore and experience the depths of the love of God in isolation. You cannot. You cannot do it 
meeting with church, and church is you. You have to do life with other people to experience the height, the depth, the width, and the length of God's love. And by the way, the goal in that passage is so that we would come to the fullness of the measure of God. God wants to, and there in Ephesians chapter 4, God wants us to be filled with all the fullness of God. Calvary, I, I pray that when you come to any, any meeting here, I pray you'll come with a holy expectation. But I also pray, Cheryl did a great job in the announcements, talking about we've not arrived, right? We, we keep learning, we keep growing. Until you are filled to the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ, until Ephesians 3, you have the fullness of God in you in a tangible, expressional way, I want to challenge you, there's still more room to grow. Amen? And so this idea that we're just going to gather for a lecture, we're just going to listen to some messages, we're going to sing some songs, I want to challenge that as a really low bar. The bar is to become like Christ. The bar is Jesus emptied himself so that he could be filled with everything that God had for him, and then Jesus the Christ ascends and gives us the spirit of Christ so that we can live just like he lived. He showed us how humans were supposed to live, and until we've come to the full measure of Christ, we've got a little growth area. And so, Calvary, let's raise our expectations. Today, I wasn't as, as angry as I was yesterday. That's progress, amen? Amen. Isn't it? Today, I learned to love a little bit more because God put somebody who was really unlovable in my path, and I got to practice. I didn't do so good today, but I'm going to get to practice tomorrow, right? You know, I had a chance to ask people for prayer, but you know, I was, I was too scared of being open and honest I was afraid they'd judge me, so I didn't share with anybody. But you have another opportunity at the end of the service here, or at any time, you can grab some, well, not while I'm preaching, but you can grab somebody and say, hey, would you pray for me? Amen? He wants to teach us how to stand up and fight. In Psalm 110, verse 3, the scripture says, in your day of battle, your troops... Not your individual troop, but your troops will be willing. God wants to raise us up to be a mighty army. And God wants us to be this army that's moving forward together, that's advancing, that's serving God's purposes together. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it talks about no soldier gets so entangled in the everyday affairs of life that, that he's no longer able to please his his commanding officer. We, we want to learn how to be people who, who know how to stand and fight. And again, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 18, it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is the principalities, the powers, the world forces of darkness. It's the spiritual forces of wickedness that are empowering and authorizing things. By the way, our human adversaries, the Bible teaches us, Jesus said to love our enemies, right? And so, does he, does he say, well, if they're not of your political party? Or does he say, if they don't drive like you? Or if they don't, if they don't look like you? Then he wants to show us how to possess our inheritance. Joshua chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. God just has this great inheritance for us, and it's for us to claim as a people, not just isolated individuals. Calvary, we have a wonderful future together. And so community accomplishes this in a shared life, in a shared vision, in a shared mission, and we live out community together. That's our joy. That's our privilege. And I want to thank you for being a part of the journey. 
And I want to invite us to be a people who understand that we were meant to do life together and with our triune God. And I want us to show up as people who are aware, who are aware of God, who have a vision for what God is doing, and that we're making an impact together like we've we celebrated today our impact just at Hair Grove, but there's many other places that we're having impact. And so thank you for being a part of this vision. Thank you for being a part of this journey together in this committed community. Amen? Let's stand.